to uh, win in the case of conflict. But it's sort of a terrible way to have a team uh, work with each other. Basically, we want to accept that specificity completely screws up the cascade. Um, we talk a lot about uh, JavaScript, the good parts. But okay, there are CSS good parts, and there are CSS awful parts that are better completely avoiding if you can. Specificity is an awful part. It is not a good part. Um, the cascade is a good part. Um, so we have to think about what do we need to do with specificity so that we can let the cascade be as powerful as possible. Um, and the answer is that in most cases, we need to really simplify specificity. We shouldn't be using specificity if we can help it. And how do we do that? Uh, first up, you want to use hacks sparingly. Um, it can be really tempting um, to create something like up at the top, you see the dot. Wow. You can't really see that, can you? So up at the top, there's a class name, dot IE. This is something a lot of companies do. They'll add a class to the body or to the HTML element um, that corresponds to the, the current user's browser. And then within the CSS file, they can um, sort of target that browser. But what does that do? It basically means that the rule that we're writing for IE is stronger than the rule that it's trying to overwrite. So if we've done any kind of inheritance in our CSS, any kind of aggregation of rules, all of our aggregation is going to be broken in IE. And we'll be the first one screaming that IE sucks, right? <laughs> when actually it's our code that, that uh, fundamentally was using hacks inappropriately. So instead of that, you basically want to um, use underscored star hacks. They don't screw with specificity. Um, people think it's dirty. Maybe it is kind of dirty, but you're supposed to feel kind of ugh if you're putting these things in your code. That's all right. Um, they still keep the specificity the same. They keep that most important part uh, um, consistent. How many people are using hacks? Of course, right? Everybody needs a little bit of zoom. Um, and how many people use a .ie class or, you know, .firefox? Yeah, there are a few, right? It, yeah, it's a pretty common way. People think of it as, as sort of cleaner, uh, but it ends up making your CSS file size grow. So we want to avoid styling IDs at all costs if we can help it. Um, why is that? Because they're so much stronger than, than a class name. They're going to muck with your specificity so much that you really can't manage to get uh, your cascade working properly. Basically, you want to code things so that they're all the same, and then all you have to do is change their order in the style sheet to say which one overrides which in case of conflict. Um, IDs as well, they're, they're something like singletons in a way. Um, they're meant only to be used once. In terms of performance and in terms of style, that's kind of the worst case scenario. Uh, so it's best to save IDs for JavaScript. You also want to avoid styling elements directly unless you're defining the default values. So this is sort of like our headings case. You want to have a default value for your H3, um, but you don't want to say H3 when it's inside of this or H3 when it's inside of that. Instead, if you want to, um, if you want to change the way your, your H3 or your list uh, looks, add a class name to the element you're actually trying to override. You also want to avoid important. How many people use important? Okay, a lot. Yeah, you know, in each one of these rules that I'm giving you, it's like the general case, and then there's the case where it's okay to do the thing we're telling you not to do. Um, it's not an absolute, it, there's nothing that replaces a smart developer who makes a good decision in the right moment with that code. Um, but generally speaking, you want to avoid important um, unless you're dealing with a leaf node. Um, if it's like the end, end, end leaf node, like uh, say for example, you want to create a, um, a tiny class that changes the text color to your company's default color. So you can use it to you know, highlight something using a span or an emphasis within the text. That would be the case where you want to use uh, an, an important because you want that to win. You know you aren't going to have another node inside your, inside your strong or inside your, your emphasis. So it's okay to use it uh, in that particular case. When we can, we also want to style classes rather than elements. Um, this will allow us to have reusable chunks that we can move around. So rather than saying div.error, we want to say just .error. 
and most of the code should go into the dot error class. Then we use div.error or paragraph.error or em.error just to define the things that are different from our base case. You're kind of trying to say, I don't know what somebody's going to build on my site six months from now. So I'm going to create a little Lego that can be used to make an error, and they're free to try it on a paragraph. And if it works out for them, fantastic. If it doesn't, they're free to adapt it using p.error um, to sort of extend the, the existing Lego, the existing class. We also want to give all the rules the same strength. Um, so we don't want to have uh, really long selector strings um, that touch on every single node. If, for example, gosh, it's far too big, so you can't see it at all. Um, if you have, for example, a, a standard module format, which is the YUI's answer to having a module. It's, it's a head, body, and foot with a wrapper around it. Um, if you want to change the way the head looks or the way the body looks, you should always go module name head, you know, module name body. You don't want to do you know, HTML body, module name head. Um, you'll end up with a, you know, selector strings that sort of don't play nice together. Each one of them might be perfectly fine, but they don't interact together nicely. So the best uh, and most important rule is to avoid duplication. Um, this is sort of, uh, all the other rules kind of feed into this, all the, all the other um, sort of uh, parts of the equation that end up with massive CSS feed into um, a lot of duplication. Uh, but it's sort of great because this is where you're going to be able to get data that shows you how your uh, site has gone awry. First up, rep is your friend. Um, it's really great, really fast, and easy way to figure out um, in what, what ways your style sheet have, have grown and um, what kind of fixes that you need. So first up, um, you can grep for colors. Um, text treatments, backgrounds, chrome, it will be used in all kinds of different ways, but it's still useful to know um, how those colors are, are being used in the, in the style sheet. So when I joined Facebook to do consulting there, I grabbed for Facebook Blue, thinking, well, this will be an interesting place to start. Um, how many times will that have been defined? It turns out it was defined 261 times. Um, I'm not saying it would ever go down to one. It won't. That wouldn't make sense at all. There are going to be different applications for it. But a lot of these are going to be sort of hiding um, headings. They're going to be hiding text treatments. They're going to be hiding um, missing little Legos that we need to then create to make it easier for people to do that thing they're trying to do. It's kind of paving the cow paths. By grepping your CSS file, you're like, okay, what are all these developers trying to make? Okay, now I can make it for them better so that next time they need one, all they have to do is add a class to their HTML and not change the CSS at all. This is another big thing we figured out uh, while working at Facebook. Was it was better if, for the most part, engineers didn't have to touch the CSS. Um, they were happier, and surely the front-end UI engineers were a lot happier. Um, it just worked out better. So the goal there now is to create uh, classes that are reusable within the HTML, so new pages don't require new CSS necessarily. Then I thought it'd be cool to look at unique colors. So how many colors are being defined on the Facebook site? Um, and it turns out it was 548 unique colors. And obviously, this is not on any one page. This is all across like every nook and cranny of the Facebook site. Um, but it does sort of make us wonder, like how how many of those colors are like you know a few colors off from Facebook blue, or a few colors off from the right gray that's supposed to be used for the background. Um, so you can do certain things to to check um, how your colors are being used in the page. And some of them were weird. You know, there'd be like weird orange colors that I know I've never seen um, on the site. Then I thought, so how many color declarations are there? And I checked. There were 640, 6,498 color declarations on the Facebook site. I was like, oh my god, <laughs> right? I would expect it to be higher, obviously. Many of the colors, the 500 or so colors that were defined, are going to be used more than once. I didn't expect it to be an order of magnitude higher. Um, to me, this meant there was a problem. There was a there was a, a difficulty in the way colors were being applied.